Man United wanted us to go on trial. There was Everton. There was a load of clubs that put. I was always set on, on just being at Villa. It was just, it was like I said, it was home. I just remember having all the gear and I was thinking, this is this is the one. And my dad went, take a step back, you. He went, you know, you, you ain't got you ain't got nowhere yet. Andrew Byfield, get over here and sort of take us in the first team changing room. And these are going to be in here soon. And they'll be having them shirts off you and all that. He'd walk in with these little dogs, you know, the gaffer did, he just used to strong his dogs, little shih tzus would be strolling behind him, and he'd look at me and go, you don't want to be doing that, do you? He went, leave that. He went, Jimmy's taking the dogs out for a walk. The thought of actually seeing my shirt hanging up, I can't wait to put that on. It was almost like everyone stopped in the whole stadium. It was like it was dead quiet. <laughs> One of the worst managers I've ever, ever been under. At that stage of my career, he put the nail in the coffin for me. It haunts me so bad that I didn't put it further in the corner where the keepers made the save. I just started ban just bouncing around in the, in, the, in the office. I wanted to sort of jump on him and he was like, he went, you just got to relax. And I've got that, that runners up one, which is, is upstairs in the drawer somewhere because, you know, unless I'm winning, it doesn't do anything for me at all. I, I, I always had in the back of my mind, I was going to prove Martin wrong. This is football, welcome to football, you know, you, these, are the, these are the ups and downs you're going to have in your career. You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Welcome to the latest episode of Claret and Blue podcast. We've um, we've uh, managed to um, pull off uh, another coup by getting uh, an Aston Villa legend. Is that too? Is that fairly Villa legend? Um, well, I don't know. I don't really like being branded as that, but I mean, if the, <laughs> a few people do call it me, I, I suppose I got to go with the flow. <laughs> what we're going to do? We're going to take you on a wonder Claret and Blue nostalgia trip on a wonder down memory lane. So. Best place to kick off, I suppose, is, is at the beginning. What, when, when was the first time you kind of experienced having a football at your feet, Lee, and you, you realised that you, you'd fallen in love with the game? Um, I think, I'm, it, I mean, you've got, I've got to say it was early on. Um, I mean, having the upbringing of my dad being a, a footballer, it was it was kind of sort of, it was blooded into, into me, really. Um, you know, as a, as a two, three-year-old, I'd always have a football with me, as I was told by my, you know, my mum and dad that, Anywhere I want, anywhere I went, I'd have a, 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 a football where I could uh, sort of have a kick about and, and, and sort of, you know, I'd always just have a ball with me anywhere I went. So it was, I think it sort of came from having that, that sort, of, sort of football background, which was obviously dad and, and uh, obviously my family, you know, they're, they're all sort of football crazy, to be honest. Um, you know, the whole family going to, going, to, going to as bad as being my nan, who's, who's a season ticket holder at Blues, which I, I always give her loads of flack for. Um, could never turn her, to be honest. But yeah, I think that was just that was just how it was. As a young boy, I, I was always sort of, I was always sort of wanting to be a football. That was, uh, that was from an early age and when I was in, and, and dad sort of took me to his games and, you know, I watched sort of playing his bits of football and managing. So, um, Anywhere I went, I, I was I was with him really. So you mentioned you mentioned your dad and the blues thing. Was he was he kind of competitive dad? Kind of was he quite pushy that you had to play football, or was it left down to you? Do you know what? He he was never pushy. He would always he was quite clever. My dad was in in the way he did things. And I mean, he's a he's a Scotchman, which you know speaks for itself. Really, he was he was a tough, horrible man as a player um, and as a manager. You know, I, I sort of watched him and, and I think any lad that, that, that's got a dad who, who, who's gone and achieved what, you know, what dad did. I mean, he, he didn't go and play maybe the top, top level um, uh, at the time. But, you know, I think you always want to go and follow your dad's footsteps uh, in them occasions. And, you know, just watching the way he... He spoke to players, uh, which were nice at times, and, and the way he sort of spoke to me on a level where I mean, there was lots of times where I, I, I was playing as a, as a youngster, and he was he was very very hard and and, and very sort of not, I wouldn't say brutal, but he he sort of gave me a, a kick up the backside when I was needing one because you know he, he's he's been there and done it, and I think. You know, I had this conversation a lot with him, really, and he's, you know, we're, we're like the best of pals, you know. It, it, it's crazy because he, he always was quite harsh on me because he wanted to get the best out of me. And, 
you know, if it, it was something that he'd set up for me in the garden where he'd, he'd, we'd have the goals in the garden, he'd set out the, the cones and, and said, you know, this is, how, this is how we do a bit of dribbling and, and get your shots off and stuff like that. And it was just me in the garden. I did that constantly. Um, Kick-ups. Um, he was always on to me about getting my first touch and getting control of the ball. And it was he'd always give me a, a benchmark of what to hit. So he, he'd, he'd sort of leave the ball in more, my court and, and, and say to me, you know, if you want to go and do it, you, you go and do it. There's the tools for you to go and work on. That's what I want you to do. And, and when I, I did do it, he'd, he'd come out and watch me. And, and I wouldn't say give me a pat on the back, but he'd say, yeah, you've still got a long way to go, which, which always kept my, uh, my feet on the ground. And with your dad being, being at Blues and you say, I mean, I love that, that your nan's at a Blues season ticket holder. Was there, <laughs> any, was there any ever thoughts that, that you'd be kind of led down, down the dark side? <laughs> well, well they, I mean, to be honest, we, 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 I mean, I, I was, I mean, obviously, I was born in Stolio, but I, I lived in Halifax for a while. While Dad was at Halifax, so when I did come to Birmingham, um, I mean, it, I, I was, I was, a, I proper had the sort of northern accent, which weren't great to be honest, because you can imagine going into a Birmingham school and it's, it's completely the different. Well, the opposites of accents, really. I mean, some people say the Birmingham accent's terrible and, and some people say the Northern accent is. Well, I mean, I had the, the full-bloody Northern accent, which I've got a little bit of ribbon for. So I think getting over that hurdle was, was one thing. And then, obviously, living in Borsley Green, which was a stone throw from that terrible place down the road. Um, you know, I... And obviously, Nan and my uncle being big blues fans, we lived with Nan obviously um, in Blakeland Street. Um, so it was it was one of them where I don't think I really got pushed into it. I mean, don't get me wrong; I think my uncle always try to throw a Birmingham shirt on me, but it was it was never the case. It was um, it was all I always wanted to to play for Villa. I mean, it was it was something that 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 always stood out for, for me is that when I was a kid, I used to I used to sort of I mean, watch sort of games at times and get get the opportunity now and then to go and watch games. And I just remember going to the, the Villa Ground as a, as a young boy uh, with a, with a lot of friends. I think it might have been a tour of the ground, and and I went, this is like heaven. It was like you know, I want I want to I want to go on that pitch and I want I want to I want to play for this football club, which was. I mean, who would have thought that a dream like that would come true? Um, it is a boyhood's dream, and 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 to think. You know that they, all my family are all blues, and Dad played for Blues, and I, I did have the opportunity to go and sign for Birmingham, uh, which I did. I mean, not many people do know, but I, I did sign for Birmingham as a, on a school of excellence form um, for one season, and um, it was just. I mean, obviously Villa didn't. They didn't come and scout me at the time, and it was the first club that did. Um, so. You know, it was an opportunity to get myself into the pro ranks um, and see what it was all about, which Dad said it would be good for you to go and, and, and have a feel for it, which I did. And I couldn't get out of the place quick enough because <laughs> Big Ron was on the phone um, to Dad saying, we've watched him, you know, a hell of a lot. Um, I can't believe that we haven't had him down here and, and had him training with us. He says uh, we just want to skip to that, and we want to get him signed. So as soon as he comes to the school of the end of the school of excellence, can we get him down? Can we get him on uh, uh, school board forms and, and get him amongst it? Which I literally, I was. It was like heaven. Trust me, it was like <laughs> the best news as a youngster. I mean, to even think that. I mean, I was I was at a pro club, and to have Villa call at, at that stage was was absolutely. I mean, it was magnificent. It really was. Um, um, it was it was just like a dream come true, and to meet Big Ron as well was like I was just in awe of the whole the whole situation. But again, you know, I've got to give lots of credit to my dad. You know, we we sort of come out of uh, of the ground when I'd signed, and I thought this was this was it. I had all my all my clobber that I got given me um, to go training in, and I think it might have been it might I'm not sure it might have been. I don't know what it was at the time, but um, I just remember having all the gear, and I was thinking, "This is this is the one." And my dad went, "Take a take a step back, you." He went, "You know, you, you ain't got you ain't gone nowhere yet." He went, "This is just the start of a, of a, of a long road," and he says, "This is just something that you just need to take a little step back on. It's great you've got all the kit and that, but." 
just because you've got all the kit doesn't mean you're going to end up playing for, for the for the club. So you just need to relax yourself. Which when Dad said that in that a Scottish voice with a little bit of a tone on it, um, it did put, it did sort of make me think. Oh yeah, I think I better slow myself down. Which which was a was was a bit of a, a bit of a, a slap round the ear. So what what age would you have been then when you went from from Blues to Villa? Then it was thirty. I think it was thirteen when I signed at uh, Birmingham, which uh, thirteen, which took me to sort of the fourteen, which would have took me to school. School. Um, I had a school of excellence forms back in the day where you know you could go and play for for Sunday league clubs and 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 stuff like that at that, that time. Uh, which obviously I'd signed schoolboy forms, which was the two-year sort of deal, um, where obviously you know you'd go in and train uh, throughout the week, holidays. You'd go in and train, you play games uh, weekly and stuff like that. Which was it was it was it was just it was like, it was brilliant. It was just a big change in everything really, um, because I think you know it, it's okay going and training every week and and then sort of playing the game on a Sunday but you know to go to Bodmore Heath uh, on such a big transition of, of being at Birmingham was like it was just like I mean streets ahead you know it was it was something, it was something amazing so as a young lad it, it was great to be around and, and, and see a lot of the players and Big Ron like I said as a signing me, signing me at the time he'd always come over and get me involved and and, and, and you know, sort of get me to meet the players and stuff, which was, it was great. I just felt so, I felt like I'd just come home really. And, and that's why it just felt so right. And it just felt so perfect. Taking you back. So if you'd have been kind of 14-ish around the time you joined Villa, remind me uh, what what year that had been then. Are we talking what, 90, 93? 93. I'm, I'm terrible with dates. I've got, I ain't going to lie to you. But it, it would have been around 93. Yeah, it would have been. And uh, yeah, it would have been ninety three, ninety four. Would it have been what? What year? What year were you born, Lee? Seventy seven. Because I've got a feeling, and I'm going way back when. Did, what district team did you play for? Was it Erdington and Saltley? Erdington and Saltley, yeah. So, Mister with Mister Morty Boys, he was the uh, he was uh, well, he, he was my Mister Morty Boys was my um, PE teacher. I mean, this, the, the other thing is, I mean, before I'd actually signed at Villa, Washwood Heath, where I was at school. With Mr. Morty Boys, we got to the, the, I think it was the old, it was, it was Trevor Gill that, that was played at uh, Villa Park, uh, I think it was the Villa Cup or whatever, and I got to play at, I got to play at Villa Park uh, um, against Hodge Hill in the cup final, which was just, I mean, it was, it was such, it was so hard to get and get to, to get to go and play at, at Villa anyway, but to go and play then, play in the final, I mean, it was, it was, it was another thing that was a big stepping stone for me because. I remember scoring two goals in the game, and two of them was at the whole end. And it was just, honestly, I can't even, I can't even describe it. But I don't, my memory's so bad with things. But them things stand out a million miles when it comes to the football games and the goals. And I just always remember scoring, and I just, I was always thinking, imagine that whole end just full of people. And it was just it's something that I always wanted, and it always. I always used to remind myself of it all the time as a kid. Because I, I was born 78, and I remember, yeah. I, I think I was like reserve team youth back for our district, which was Worley. And yeah. was, was Darren Byfield in your team with Erlington and Saltley? Yeah, he was. Because yeah. your, names, yeah, your, your names were kind of doing the rounds as kids. I yeah. mean, I, I doubt I'd have ever played against you, because if, if I would have done, <laughs> I'd have known it, because you'd have torn me, me to bits. But even, <laughs> even back then, there was a vibe within local schools football Lee Hendry and Darren Byfield are, are the kids to watch. Yeah, there was, and, and, and there was a lot. That, I, I mean, the thing what the thing what happened was, I mean, I, I started out at sort of Chelmsford Wood and went to sort of teams that were really mediocre because uh, I didn't know where to do something. And then we ended up going to Kingshurst, and someone said to me, "Come and come and sign for Edmonton Star," which was, I mean, it was way out of the way from where we lived. Uh, we played at Woodland. Do you remember Woodlands Camp where they used to go there at school and they used to do all the the, the adventure courses and stuff like that it was. I mean, I think it's over Aldridge Way, and I, I signed for Edmonton Star. And me and well, I'd never met Darren before, and Darren was there. Uh, there was a, a host of lads that was doing the sort of rounds at the time: Justin Floyd, uh, Neil Povey. It, it all went on to football clubs, um, and obviously, me and Darren played for Edmonton Star and, and set a massive, massive combination. Me and him up front. Um, 
he was obviously the pace. You know, I had a little bit of mouse and I was a little bit of a nasty one, um, even though I was so t- I was quite small as a kid. But yeah, we 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 had a lot of attention from football clubs from then on. Um, that you know, people wanted us to go down. And see, I, even when we was at Villa, you know, we, because we signed at Villa, Villa. This this was after we signed, so it was the time where. Man United wanted us to go on trial. There was Everton. There was a load of clubs that, but I just I couldn't I just couldn't do it. I mean, I think I don't know if Darren actually went out and, and, and had a few tr- sort of trials elsewhere, but I, you know, it was just I was always set on, on just being at Villa. It was just it was like I said, it was home. What was it like being in and around Villa at, at, at that time? Then what was it like being an academy kid? Did you have to clean boots and that kind of thing? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously we we moved on to. Sort of signing uh, YTS forms, which was was, was 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 I mean it was quite crazy because you you know you come to the end of your your, your sort of schoolboy scholarship for two years and then you're waiting for the going to the office see the gaffer are you going to get offered a offered a, a YTS which you know we're all excited about we're all seeing who's going to be and and our team was I mean we had a great side um, as schoolboy so. It was quite a, quite a, a, a big blend of us went through the system and, and obviously straight into YTS, the likes of Ben Petty, Lee Birchall, Darren, myself. Um, so to, to to get the YTS was, I mean, it was it was just it was massive because it was again it was another stepping stone into going in every day. The the transition of of, of obviously coming in and training midweek and playing of a weekend a change and it was full on. It was get yourself to Villa Park, yeah. get on the, the, uh, the minibus with, with Stan James and, and if you're late, you miss the minibus, you know, you're in trouble sort of thing. So it was it was great because, you know, we, we had to do all the jobs, the whole training ground. Jim Paul was absolutely <laughs> a nightmare with the, with the youngsters, which I think if you ask any YT uh, what Jim was like, he was, he was on it, he had us cleaning the floors, he had his, oh, anything you can imagine, football boots. I mean, at the time, I think I was cleaning Gary Parker's when I first came in, um, which Parks was, was, was brilliant. And because there was, there was sort of a good connection back then with, with a lot of the old boys, you know, it, it, it was so different because, we, you know, we sort of had to chuck the door to bring the boots in. And it was a, it was a bit of a, that respect feeling in the changing room um, where you had to, sort of earn the right to get into that change room. And, and when you did go in there, it was like, have a look around, see the players in there, see what banter's going off. And it was like, whew, you know, it was quite daunting going in there because, you know, as a youngster, I mean, I had some rascal barnets back in the day. So <laughs> I knew that they'd be getting some stick, especially when I'd, I'd float in there with a curly perm that was, uh, <laughs> had that much gel in it, it would, you could snap a curl off. But um <laughs> You know, it was it was it was just it was brilliant. I mean, it, again, you know, even the, the 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 older pros, the pros who were at the time were were, were fantastic with us. Um, and and I think that was just down to a lot. A lot was down to big run. I just I always just remember he was always in and around. And if you had the youngsters that he felt that had a chance, he'd always try and he'd bring you like we'd, we'd walk past the change room and he'd go, and Andrew Byfield, get over here." And, sort of take us in the first team changing room and, and say these two and he, he'd sort of let the lads know that we we were the sort of main main players in that team and these are going to be in here soon and they'll be having them shirts off you and all that and it was it was just good it was such a, a such a good feel you know it really was and it, like I said the YTS sort of started some great fun we earned I mean it was peanuts 28 28 50 a week it was or 27 50 a week um, going up to 32 50 a week which was we didn't care. We were we were doing something that we wanted to, and we enjoyed it. Um, our mum's got their their uh, their keep for obviously for, for for looking after us and stuff. So they had their money, which weren't weren't a lot, but it was just about what what we wanted to do and what we enjoyed doing, and 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 the bonuses and the the, the sort of carrots that were dangling in front of us for us to go and uh, go and achieve a first team place. So who was your who was your best mate? Then would Darren have been your best mate coming through the ranks? Yeah. Yeah, well, me, me and Darren, we, we st- like I say, we struck a, a great friendship when I went to Ireland to star with him. And we sort of went everywhere. You, you know, you, you, you stated there that there was a big talk about how how good we were around the Midlands. And 
you, you know, we we had a good we had a good partnership. Me and Alan did. Um, you know, as, as centre forwards. I mean, I was a centre forward sort of back in the youth team days, and then I sort of moved out to wide left. Big Run again, and Colin Clark was our manager at the time, and, and Big Run would it say get him out on the left. He's got too much skill. He'd be great running at people and. He's got great versatility. He can go outside and he can come in, which he said, you know, lots of people haven't got that. And before I knew it, I was playing out on that wide left. And again, I'd have such a good link-up play with Darren because I knew that I could pop it into him. I could go and play off him. And in and around the the box, we had a a great sort of combination of play, which we always used to work on. And Colin Clark was was really really technical in, in, in them sort of skillful areas. And, we used to do a lot, a lot, a lot of work around sort of the eight, eighteen-yard box play, which was all attack-minded, which was just a dream for me and Daz. But you know, the transition of, of changing positions was 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 really strange at the time. But I just always remember Big Ron telling me that he, he pushed me out on that left-hand side because he said you'll play for England there one day, which was was quite ironic that I did end up playing for England. <laughs> Do you think it was a nice combination, Lee, that you've got Big Ron, who was kind of really lifting your confidence and making you feel 10 feet tall, and then you get home and your dad had kind of <laughs> bring you back down again? Was that a good kind of blend? <laughs> Not stuffing out of me, yeah. Yeah, it was. It really was because with, with Big Ron, it, I mean, it was it was even to the stage where, you know, I used to clean the boot room um, at the training ground, the old boot room, and I'd, uh, and, and Jim would be on my case and then I'd see the gaffer coming and he'd, he'd walk in with his little dogs, you know, the gaffer did, and he'd just use the strongest dogs, little shih tzus would be strolling behind him and he'd, he'd look at me and go, you don't want to be doing that, do you? And I went, I said, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, of course I do. I was a bit embarrassed. He went, he went, he went, leave that. He went, Jim, he's taking the dogs out for a walk. Before I know it, Darren was next to me and we had to walk the dogs around Buddy Maurice while well, the lads were cleaning the changing room. So I knew that, there was, that you know, Big Run had a, a, a good feel for, for me and Darren and, and it, it, it made that road easier going into the, into, into the club. And, and like you said, with Dad giving me that clip round the backside and the kick up the, the backside, sorry, um, just to keep my feet on the ground was was really good because it, you know when dad used to come and watch me play at Bodymore and ask me how he'd always ask me how I felt I did and you know if I felt I did okay I'd, I'd, I'd say and if I, I felt I was poor then I would but that was only through what, the way he brought me up to being like that because you know he, he was a firm believer in that you know if you think that you you have done well and you mentally you mentally think that you are you, you have done well uh, and you you know you believe it then, then fair enough. But he says, if I say that you, I don't think you you didn't you done well, then you know you've got to listen to what I'm saying. He said because some people can just go to a stage where they get comfortable, which it could have been really easy for me to do that at Villa with with, with Big Run the way he was. You know, Dad was always my my critic, and I always think that you know some games I did play well and I could have done better, but he'd always remind me of that, and and it always made me think about going into a next match that. I want to make sure that that's right. And, you know, if I'm not working hard enough, I can work hard. I did feel like he's right because the time I come up and I felt, he said, you haven't even got a sweat on. And I went, I said, well, you know, I've worked hard. He went, you, you ain't worked hard. He said, you get, you, you're getting complacent. And it just always made me think I've got to work hard. I've got to work hard. And it, it was brilliant. It was really, you know, for, for the hard background that I had in my upbringing to, to, to be a professional was all... And all of it was down to my dad and, and the dedication that he pushed me and pushed me to levels that that made me, I feel, the player that I was and, and the fit player that I was. I could get up and down the pitch because pre-seasons, you know, it's easy as a youngster, YTS, you're not earning big money. You know, it's easy to, to sort of just say, I'll go back in June, sort of... Uh, July time and you know I'll go on holiday for a couple of weeks and, and and get drunk with a few of the lads and whatnot and it wasn't the case for me dad was dad was on me he was two weeks before we went back I'd, I'd have to go running I'd have to go running he'd make me go running he'd get me fit he said because when you go back training to pre-season he says you'll all go back and you'll train with the first team and he says you be at the front of the event because when you're at the front of training and you're fit, you're two weeks ahead of everyone, 
he says people start that's looking and saying, who's this kid? And he was dead right. I used to, I was at the front with all the pros and then it was the, the bleep test. You know, I was the last one out of the bleep test and it was just down to my sheer fitness that dad had prepped me so right to go into that because he'd been there and done it himself. So it was a great blend of, of having dad and, 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 and the gaffer there at the time. So can you remember what it was like the first time you did train with a first team group? Yeah, well, again, it, it, sort of the white because we, obviously we signed sort of YTS. We went back as as as, um, as YTSs and we were started full time. So, you know, you sort of get blended in. But then all of a sudden we we'd get sort of nurtured into the group of of the first team, and you know we do the, the the fitness sort of based stuff, which like I said, we you know I, I sort of dominated the, the fitness space because I was I mean everyone would say I was you know I was only sort of sixteen at the time, but I was just, I was fit, I was sharp, and I just remember going, I remember going on a sort of lot, I think it was around uh, Kingsbury Water Parks, and I remember coming back, and I was first, and I was sort of looking behind my shoulder to see if I could see any, any players, or any, because I was just that fit, and I remember coming in, and I think it might have been, I think it was Jim Barron, and he, he sort of looked at me, and he was just, he just clapped, and he went, excellent, and it was just them little them little feelings of oh, he'll recognise me and, and dad was dad was just dead right you know that's how I, I always worked and when I went and trained with the first team I, I, dad always said to me don't be shy don't be scared to go and tackle don't be scared to go and do what you're doing because whatever's got you to where you are and whatever's got you to, to go with the first team you know there's obviously a, you're obviously doing well so don't change that uh, and I, I always, I always, always, always think about that time when it, we, 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 there was me and Darren had to go over and Big Ron had called us over to play in a, a game on, I think it was a Friday. Um, and he said, I need two players. And I, I sort of like put my hand up and he went, Darren, obviously we knew we were going to get called over because we were, we were the gaffer's favourite. So we joined in with the lads and it was, it was brilliant. I remember I remember scoring two goals in the, in the in, it was only like a, a sort of short training game, but it was just, it was brilliant. I just felt like, again, it just felt so easy and, and, and felt like I was a part of it. And, and uh, you know, again, Big Ron had joined him with the training. Um, <laughs> he used to think he was redondo and <laughs> like that. And I used to think, I, I mean, at the time I was thinking, the gaffer can't really move. He just stands out on that left wing. So, and I remember, I think I remember um, Andy Townsend telling me, it might have been Kevin Richardson saying, just don't pass to the gaffer if you're on his team. <laughs> <laughs> I just always remember that. But yeah, it was, it was brilliant. It was just, um, it, like I said, you know, the, the whole group of uh, the lads were, were, you know, were great with me and Darren, they really were. So in time, you just mentioned a couple of them there with Townsend and Richardson. That's a big, yeah. dre- that's a big dressing room to, to start training with. You've got... Polly McGrath still there. You've got yeah, Dean, was, Dean Saunders. Yeah, all the big, all the big, all the big boys were there. I mean, it, like I said, it was brilliant. It was, it was. I've got to say, out of changing rooms that I have, I've been fortunate to be in and around. That was one of the best I've, I've, I've seen. It really was. The, I mean, Dino and and Dalian loved us as well. So they'd always get us in the changing room and they would shut the door and they'd, they'd have us make me and Darren sing. It was just, honestly. <laughs> The bantering there was brilliant. Um, it really was. It, it was. It was. I remember I bumped into Dino not long ago, and he said, "Do you remember you, you wouldn't sing?" And I, I said, "Yeah," because I was saying, but they made me stand on the uh, the bench. I mean, <laughs> the, these are things that probably would, would never happen in this day and age. But um, I wouldn't sing, so they 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 got a big bucket of ice, kept filling the bath up, and I remember Bozzy and that throw me in an ice cold bath and dumping me in the bath. I was like, "Oh my god." Dino said he went, imagine that now. He said, we'd all get done for bullying. I said, yeah, no, you know, he's what? <laughs> said, I might have to drag that up. But it was, it, it was, it was brilliant. It, I mean, the guys were, you know, they were, they were first class. All of the, all the, all the pros were. How close did you get to making a debut under Ron? Was that ever, did you ever travel or were you ever in a squad with him? The first, the first time I travelled under, with, with the first team. And it, it was, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was something unbelievable because, it, it was a Coca-Cola Cup final, um, and obviously um, it was one that was managing one of at the time. Um, and we, he, he took me, he took me and Darren, um, and he took us down for the for the whole weekend. And I was just like, wow, 
I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I, I thought I, in my, in my heart, I mean, we stayed overnight. I actually thought that I was going to be <laughs> involved in the team, like in the squad. Um, it was, we were, obviously we were part of the squad. We, you know, we'd gone down exactly the same. Uh, we, I think we even had the suits and stuff like that. And it was like, I thought, I said to dad, I've got a funny feeling that I'm going to, and he went, Listen, you're not going to be involved. And I, I sort of had in my head, but it was, it was, it was good sort of, it was a good sort of mental feeling for me to feel that way because I was, I was really nervous. And I, like, we got to the ground, obviously driving down Wembley Way and stuff like, and seeing all the, the villa flags, and it was just, I, I can feel it now. It's like you know that 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 feeling was just, it was something that you. You know, I wish I could just bottle up and just take all the time because it was just, it was a, it, it was immense. It was like I was on, on, on like floating in a bubble. Um, and then to get out and see all the, the fans singing and oh, it was just amazing. And to actually be part of that, that Villa squad that got out and, and walked into the change room and the gaff went, get Jim, get him some kit. And I was thinking, oh, I'm not involved then, obviously, but which <laughs> was a bit of a, a, bit of a sucker punch. And he went, get him, um, get him some kit. And I, I remember getting kitted up. Um, obviously, went out on the on onto Wembley, which was again something that I didn't think I'd ever get the chance to. Um, and I remember warming up with Tails and the boys, and that it was, oh, it was, it was just, it was, it was special. It really was. It was, it was something that was just, you know, it, a, a boy's dream to to continue on a, a, a road that was just seemed to be just going perfect and perfect and it was just everything was just feeling right and I said you know just to, to go to go out and be a part of that squad it was I mean it was it was it was immense it really was do you think that says a lot about Ron that even you know he'd have had quite a lot to occupy his mind that time but even then he was thinking about kind of almost a little psychological boost for you and Darren I do and I, I really do because you know, it wasn't just, just, I mean, there's lots of good things that you can talk about, but there's lots of things that you could turn around and, you know, some games where, say, the first team weren't playing and we were playing on a Friday afternoon and the boys, had, the first team had trained and obviously the youth team were playing or, and he'd bring the lads over to, to watch the youth team and he went, he always says it to me to this day, he went, you know, he went, I just, I, I wanted to come over and watch you and Darren he says, and then when I brought all the lads over that, he says at times when they weren't playing, he said I'd find them just finished training and rather than going to the change room, they'd filter over to the next pitch where we were playing and they'd all stand and watch, which again is very rare, but that's that's just the way I think Ron sort of bedded into his players and his man management skills and, and I mean he and he was a fantastic manager, you know, there's no there's no doubt about what he what he'd done in his managerial career, but you know, I think the the little touches that he, he had and he brought to that football club was were special. And I, I don't think it had just been me. I'm pretty sure he did it with a lot of the players that he, he brought through. Um, because every every person I speak to that's worked under one adore the way he is. And, you know, Carlton Palmer is one that that I see quite a bit. And he, yeah, I mean, he just absolutely loves Ron to to to, to, to bits. He really does. And a lot of the lads that you talk about, you know, I'll give him a bit of banter, but. You know, he's just an absolute character. So, why do you think you didn't get your debut under him, Lee? Was it just a little bit too soon? I think, I think so. Yeah, I think it was. I think, I think Ron would have loved to, loved to give me my debut. I really do. Um, I, I still, I still think that he just knew that he didn't want to sort of throw me in at that deep end. As, a, as a, I mean, you know, not forgetting, I was a skinny sort of <laughs> 16, 17 year old lad that was. I had no meat on him. It was just, just pure. My body fat was not zero. <laughs> it was just, so I think, you know, to throw me in, in them situations and, and I think at the time there might have been only been two, three subs, you know, so I think it would have been a bit too soon for me to do that. And I think knowing where Ron had been and his experience of managing, you know, I think that he knew it was, it was just a matter of time before it would happen. But, you know, I felt that he, he definitely, he definitely did protect me in that sense. There's a random picture in our archives of <laughs> you during the, um, I think it was the night. Well, it was, it was the night when yeah. Phil, Phil King scored the penalty against Inter Milan yeah. at Villa Park, 
And you, oh, it's just, it's just you, Corn. You got a curtain haircut, and you're just <laughs> jumping up and down, celebrating by the tunnel. I think so. What, what was your involvement on match days? Then were you just kind of well, that, that that game in particular? A big Ron came in and he said, "Everyone, make sure you're in your tracksuits." Um, I want ball boys. We, I think they did like a multi ball. So if he went out, they wanted it quick back onto the pitch. He wanted, he wanted to keep the flow going and. I, I, my, my duty was right by the tunnel, which was brilliant because, you know, I got to see all the players coming in and out. And, um, and that evening, uh, in particular, with the penalties, well, the, all the, the lads were back in, but I sort of stuck with where I was situated. The gaffer came out and he, was, he, he, he sort of was speaking to me there and then he was stood in front of me. And obviously I was, I was just watching the penalty and I was, like a, I was buzzing like in the background. But I just, I, I, I remember that because... It was in, I think it was in the, it might have been in the paper the next day, obviously, with Big Ron, very, stood there like, you know, no emotion. And and then you've got me with the dodgy barnet behind, like, give me one of them in the background. Um, and, and and I remember the, the clip he's saying um, something about Big Ron, he said, and, and the boy fan behind, and obviously it was me, it was the boy fan. <laughs> um, so I, I've, I've still got that clipping in my, uh, with, with all my football clippings, which is, is, is quite, quite a funny Quite a funny uh, caption, really, to be honest. Knowing that I was obviously um, a youth team player at the time and went on to play for the club, which was it just showed that I, you know my, my emotions were like that when I scored a goal for for, for the club. So to to watch uh, Kingy bang that penalty in was it was it was a bit amazing. I reckon your clippings for must have probably your debut when you were sent off at QPR. To tell tell us your thoughts about that. Yeah, that, uh, again, that was. It was such a mixed feeling. It, it really was. It was absolutely, uh, like I said, you know, the pinnacle to 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 actually travel down to be on the bench to put that claret and blue shirt on. You know, to put a Villa shirt on. It was just. It was. It was amazing. I. I, I mean, it, the thought of actually seeing my shirt hanging up which I always remember Jim used to hang the shirts up because I was sort of in and around the sort of squad and there was lots of talk um, from fans that had seen me playing in the reserves and how well I'd been doing, um, you know, sort of around the 21, the England under 21s and stuff like that. And I, I just remember Jim Paul used to hang sort of the subs out and then he put shirts out that could be subs. Um, so he'd sort of second guess. Obviously, he had to have the shirts. And I always remember my name... My shirt being there, and I thought, oh, God, I can't wait to put that on. And the times that I'd, I'd, I'd go in the chair, I was sort of in the, uh, the squad, I had to turn up. I, I knew I was never going to be on the bench. And and then to, to actually be on the bench um, at QPR and see my, my shirt there was like, wow, this is, I just felt, I just felt amazing because I wanted to go over, I wanted to just feel the top and just wanted to put it on. I literally wanted to put the top straight on so the gaffer wouldn't change his mind, to be honest. But I think that was just, that that excitement went out on, straight out onto the pitch. You know, I wanted to get out, I wanted to warm up straight away. I just couldn't wait for someone to walk out the, the door so I could follow them out and, um, at the, you know, before the game and then warming up. I remember warming up quite a bit and I was just wanting to get, Another thing, what Dad has said, always get the managers. You know, I keep warming up, and I kept doing it, and then obviously I, I ended up coming on, which was I, I, it was it was almost like everyone stopped in the whole stadium. It, it was like it was dead quiet, and I just I remember just having the, like such a, a butterfly feeling, but it's such an excited feeling, thinking I can't wait to get on there, I cannot wait, and then to get on. And and obviously, <laughs> the way the way it ended was just. Uh, I mean, it was it, like I said, the mixed emotions from going from that to to that was like it happened so quickly as well. You know, it was uh, handball for a yellow card, and then I remember mean, Rufus Brevi, and I ended up just it just sort of clicked in. But it was it was nothing malicious. It was just me being a a young man that was very anxious, very excited and wanting to make a, a, a point that I was, I was good enough to play in the team. And when I seen him like putting his hand, I think it was Wilkie that he won it. I know it was Wilkie and he put in and give me the second yellow. And I remember like, I think it was Andy Tans and a lot of players around the with like saying, 
you know, sort of trying to sort the ref around. And before I knew it, I, that silence come again because I had to walk past the dugout, the gaffer, and down the tunnel. Um, I mean, for someone to make his debut, that that I, that I said about all them highs of them ladders that I've had, and and then to walk down that tunnel and think. I just didn't. I really didn't want to walk down the tunnel. It was, it was, it was so, it was so emotional. I, I mean, bringing it back, I take myself back to it, and I walked down the tunnel and then into the change room, and no one came in the change room for a couple of minutes or so. And I was just sat there. And I just did. I really didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to keep my boots on. I just sat there. And obviously, I didn't want to take the shirt off. Um, and then the door flung open and. Ray Wilkins, who was was player manager at the time, came in, and it, it was just a bit of a. I thought he was coming in to get me out of the changing room, and then he come and sat next to me and put his arm around me, and just it was it was just surreal. It was someone who I've seen play football, a legend of the game, to come and put his arm around me and just sort of console me and, and say, "This is football. Welcome to football. You know, you, these are the, these are the ups and downs you're going to have in your career." He said, there's lots of people that are talking highly of you. He said, you've got a big future in the game, kid. And as he took, as he sort of got up, he just tapped my, sh- he said, keep that up. And just walked out the door. And I was like, I didn't know if to sort of bounce around. I just <laughs> didn't know what to do. It was, it was, honestly, it was just, it takes me back so, so clearly of how, how good it was. And, and that, that feeling of, what, what and then, it, and then it was back to, What's the gaffer going to say when he walks in? And <laughs> he didn't say nothing to me, which which really made me feel a little bit sort of down, down in that that's that sort of because I needed I needed someone to come and you know put their arm around me and and say to me you know what I did wrong or what I, you know did right or just give me some 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 form of, of contact or talk really and, and and the gaffer didn't do that, which you know was a bit of a was a bit of a, a, a knockdown for me. Because it's all right me having knockbacks from my dad, but when you're trying to impress a manager and you're trying to burst onto the scene, you know, you you just I think that's when my management comes into play. Where I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying that it was you know it was bad, but it was just the way that the gaffer works at the time, and he, he, he didn't do that, and that that really gave me a bit of a. It took me a bit of a while to get over that. I've got to admit. What was your relationship like generally with Brian then? Again, I get on with the gaffer. So I, I, I call him the gaffer all the time. It's, it's all right. But I mean, I get on with Brian all the time, you know, now. Probably even more better than what I did. And Brian was, I, I, I remember having a conversation playing golf with him and he said, you know, he said to me, I said, gaffer, you've changed so much. You know, you, you're very, you know, he's, he's out there. He's, he's fun. He's, he's bubbly. And I, I think everyone always used to say, Brian was like that, but when he was a manager, he said, you know, the pressure that came with it and, you know, the way that I had to change my personal self, how I had to conduct myself to players and be around players, he said, I had to be different. He says, and, you know, then times when I was at Villa, he said, there was always that pressure that was balancing because the club was so big and there was expectations. Um, and I, I, I understood it. I understood it. And I'm glad he did speak to me about that because... He didn't freeze me out of the side. He kind of, I think he, he, he kind of protected me from, from throwing me back in there and, and, and back out into the, to the Wolves, really, where I think he wanted me to sort of take a step back, let me have a look at things, let me watch things. He still took me on, on in the squads and stuff. Um, but I just felt that there was a lot of games that I could have been playing in that sort of period of time because, again, you know, there was a lot of fans when I got, when I sort of made my debut. There was a lot, still lots of fans wanting me to to, to get in amongst and, and be a part of it. And Brian just didn't he didn't have that sort of push to go and give me a, get, get me out onto the pitch again, which was was, was unfortunate. But I, I totally understand where he was coming from, and I totally understand now why he did it. Really, the brilliant thing about watching Lee Henry back then was just what a wind up merchant you were. It's kind of you, you. You're the kind of player who opponents hate. You know, if you can't. And you're better. Better technically, you're a better footballer than. But I think you're our equivalent of Robbie Savage. Just the way that you kind of used to annoy people so much. You know, the, the, the players that I've, I've played against. You know, some big players that, that I always come across now because they're doing a lot of these sort of 
the media work and sort of the the, the, the old sort of pro games and the ex pro games and 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 all the lads they they all say it's just, I used to hate playing against you. You were you were fit. You used to run around. You used to wind everyone up. You said everyone wanted to boot you, and it was like you just you used to get up and give a little bit back, and then let everyone join in. And I said, I said, I know. I said, I can't, I can't, I couldn't help it. That was that was my thing. I think I felt that I was just protected all the time. It, it was so weird. Like, listen, I'm, I'm, I couldn't, I couldn't even, I couldn't have a fight with a worm. Me, I'm, I've got nothing to do me. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it crawled all over me. But you know, I think it was just. The fact that I, I was in surroundings where I felt like oh, no one could touch me, and, and that wasn't just with the, the players, it was the, the fans, it was the whole feel of it. It was just, it, it just felt like I could do it. And, you know, I did used to get involved and I did used to sort of wind people up. And I, you know, I would, if someone did, you know, do my head in during the game, I'd make sure I'd, I'd try and get one over on them, which. I just re- I always remember the South tackle on the advertising boards where I came on as a sub and I just thought, he's, get- he's getting it when I come on. And I came on and I- it just he had a bad touch out wide and I thought, this is prime, I'm just going to smash him. He's against Leicester and I just absolutely nailed him. And he, he was lying rolling round, his hair was all covered in sand where the, the <laughs> side of the pitch was. And I remember Jerry Taggart and uh, Frank Sinclair grabbing me and I'm almost having a fight with two of the biggest <laughs> on the pitch. And then... You know, I've got the boys, big Hugo come in and I thought, I'm safe, Hugo's here. So it was, like I said, you know, it, 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 I was a wind-up merchant, but it, it was something that was just in my make. I still am now, you know, that it's something that I've, it, it's just, it's that mentality that I've, I've always had and I, 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 I can't control it and I've never been able to. And that's why sometimes I'm a, I've been a fool to myself because I, I wear my heart on my sleeve and, and, and it, it overtakes what I'm doing. And sometimes it's just where I've got to take that t- breath that second breath and say you know I don't have to do that I can just walk away but when someone gets my back up I'm, I'm gone I'm, I'm just like a I see red that's like that switch that comes on and I just can't I can't control it. it's terrible Is that a bit of your Scottish ancestry or heritage <laughs> do you think? I'm, I'm thinking so yeah because, yeah because we've got no uh, we've got no fighters or, or boxers in our family but I think it must be the Scottish um the half Scottish blood that I've got floating around, it, it comes on every now and then. Can I ask you a little bit about this kind of bad boy <laughs> reputation that you've had, like being a bit of a, a party animal? And it was a story. Can you, can you, I don't know whether all these years later, you can clarify <laughs> exactly what happened with that golf buggy? <laughs> oh, my word. I can, you know what? I, there's so many stories that I, because I was that bad boy, it was just, oh, he's done it, he's done it. And it, uh, half the time I hadn't done it. That was the, that was the annoying thing, really, because. <laughs> we were playing at the Forest of Arden, and there was uh, there was myself, um, and it was yeah, there was Crouchy, Gareth, and uh, a, a pal of mine that, that used to come golf. And we came off the, I think it was the it might have been fourteenth on one of the holes on, on the Far East, and you have to go past the house. So we, we sort of I took we put our shots in, and they were faffing about on the green doing something, and they part the buggy. And it was like kind of slant because we just used to park him everywhere and because th- we thought we could. And we sort of went to the slide the side of the house. And it was me, I'm sure it was me and Crouch. And we sat, sat just on the buggy. And we must have sat there right, thinking about an hour. And, and I went, where, where are them two? And it was Gaz and um, I think it was Barnsley. And I went, I said, where are they? So we went back. And I've, all I can, as we come back through, all I can see is them two stood there trying to pull this buggy out of the ditch where it's gone straight down and you can just see the roof hanging out the top. Well, we have literally killed over laughing. I mean, it, it was it was the funniest thing I've seen. But next week, you know, we go in, I've, I've told the course marshal, we go in and then it's in the paper that I've, because I'm the member there, I've crashed the buggy. Which was what I can assure you, it wasn't me. I was sat on that next tee, waiting for them clowns to come through, and I ended up getting the uh, getting all the uh, the press headlines. Uh, so, but that was just that reputation that seemed to seemed to follow me. And listen, I'm not saying I was, I was any angel by any any stretch, but anything that went wrong, it, it, my name had come straight to the forefront. 
I can't believe you're sticking to that story all these years on your nose. But <laughs> it's, uh, I bet, listen, I bet the, the, all the ones you're blamed for, I bet there's a fair few that you got away with as well, to be fair, back in the day. Yeah, there were, yeah, there was, of course, there was. You know, they, them ones stay in the, uh, them ones stay in the closet, you know what it's like. And they'll come out on a, on a rainy day. Maybe if I, I pull a book out of the bag, but I think that might open a can of worms up. I was a bit of a fanboy. I think similar age to you. I was a bit of a fanboy back then, and we used to see you in Liberties, Stoony yeah. Bakers. Where, where, where was the best scene for you back then? Oh, Stoony Rhino. What you, you miss Stoony <laughs> Rhino? You know, <laughs> <left the heaven. laughs> <laughs> no, um, we, we well, we got introduced for, to uh, Liberties because we every now and then Yorkie and Bozzy would go up there, and you go, and because we were sort of floating in and around the squad, we. We'd end up in uh, Liberty. So Liberties was the one because it, it was a young lad and there's a few of the older birds in there and you used to think, well, I've got a chance here. It was like, um, it was like grab a granny in there. It was, but um, <laughs> it was, uh, it, it, yeah, Liberties was the place. And then we ended up going down to, obviously time's moved on and we ended up going into uh, Studi Bakers, which was the, the just rife place at the time. You know, it was full of, Young girls, uh, young lads, we were just, we'd sort of take over when we come in. Um, you know, the likes of me, Gareth, you know, Crouchy when he was down, Jay Lloyd. It was, that was the place to be uh, in Birmingham on a, on a Saturday night where if you wanted to see any footballers, you, you've got every chance that you would in there. So it was, that was, that was where it all started. For all the sort of bad press that I did have, I'm, you know, I, you know, there was there's there was always a lot of bad stuff that was always knocking around about me, and and you you know yourself, lots of people would say so many things, and you just think I don't know where some of these people get some of the stories they do get, some of the things that that you get branded doing, they're just absolutely ridiculous. It was you know it was just because you're in a city that's got two rival clubs that hate each other. Um, you ask anyone majority of the people that were saying it were the Birmingham fans so that was all they could do is hang on and, and, and try and and try and bring that the, the, the club down which it was never going to it's too, too far down that is you know they'll be either slagging me or they'll be slagging Villa and it's it's like you know the obvious the obvious candidates where sometimes I wish I could jump back now and think what on earth was I doing why was I reacting to people like that but that wanted to drag you down. We asked Gabby this the, the other week. What did he spend his first pay pack packet on? I think he said he bought a Lacoste tracksuit. Can you remember what you, you spent your first one on? <laughs> yeah, I can. I bought, um, me and Darren actually, we went to a shop um, in town called Al- Altex and they used to sell like Lacoste stuff there and um, we went and bought ourselves some Rockport's um, I think they were, I don't know how much they were back in the day. I had the black leather ones and Darren had some sort of darker brown ones. Um, and we said, our first pay pack, we're going, we're going to go and buy ourselves some of them. Because, and then it started to materialise into, we had the uh, Stone Island jeans and then it was the cost shirts and it was before we, we were kitted out. But it was, um, it took a little bit of a while because, you know, when you get your first pay pack, you want to start wearing the decent club. You want to start sticking with the lads that are in the, the changing room. And yeah, the, the rock ports were the one for us. I, I think even we ended up wearing our rock ports with our villa tracksuits when we went into training at times. <laughs> Can you uh, back, just back on the pitch? When was it that you, you finally felt you were kind of fully fledged member of the of the squad? Lee, was it under Gregory or under Brian? Yeah. Just, you were a little yeah. bit in and out under Brian still. It was in and out under, under Brian, but as soon as JG came in, he was straight away. He'd worked with us, obviously, um, previous to, to that, and he came in, and, and before we knew it, I mean, I was playing against Atletico Madrid, and I was, I, was a, I was a regular feature in the squad. I was playing a lot. You know, John didn't... He, he sort of came in, which I really, really do like that he did that, because there's not many managers that would, would come in and just sort of take, not take a punt, but just sort of change the whole sort of style and the way the team was. You know, the likes of Gareth Barry coming in at such a young age as well. Um, Jay Lloyd was was sort of in and out of the team. And, you know, he, he was trying to bring a lot of young lads in that he felt that were, were well equipped to go and to go and play in the, in the side. You know, Darren was on the bench and, and got a few, few appearances. You know, Stefan Moore, there was lots of players that he just brought in and says, you know, 
this is the way I'm going to roll. And, and he did. And, you know, I think that's when I felt that I was, I was an established player and, and I was part of the furniture. So tell us about the England call-up, how that came about. You know, there was, there was talk about, you know, how well we were doing at the time. Um, there was talk about, obviously, myself, uh, Dion, and Alan Wright, obviously, where it was, was in the squad as well. Was it Merced as well? I think it was. It was quite crazy, really, because there wasn't... <laughs> well, Villa really didn't get a mention when it comes to sort of the England squads. And all of a sudden, you know, there was a, there was a handful of us going, going down. And I just remember there was talk about it in the paper, building up to the, to, to the call-ups. And the gaffer pulled me in, uh, sort of, when he, when he got, the, they got the call. And he called, he called me in the office and I thought, What's he going to say to me? And I, I didn't know whether I was going to get called up. Or he was going to say, "You're not, you're not, you haven't been called up." And he went, "Congratulations, you've you've deserved everything that you've, you've achieved. You went, you've been called into the England squad." And I just, I just started bang, just bouncing around in the in, in the office. I was like a, I was just like a kid. It was just, it was. I wanted to sort of jump on him, and he was like, "He went, you just got to relax. You know, he said you've done, you've done really well." And I just. It, it was emotional, really. It really was. I, I do remember sort of coming out, but rather than going into change rooms, coming out and getting some fresh air because, it, again, to think that I was going to go and join up with the England squad, it just, wow, well, it's the pinnacle of football, you know, to put on uh, a, 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 an England shirt with, with the three lines on was, you know, the next best thing to, to putting on a Villa shirt, which in my eyes, but... You know, it was the fact that I'd been called into an England squad, which, you know, at that time there were some big players that were running around the Premier League. So it was just a, a dream come true. And to, to let the family know, what, you know, what, what had actually happened, I, oh, it was it was amazing. It was the best best feeling. So if that crossbar had been a little bit narrower... <laughs> well, it was a post. It was just... I sort of... When I, when I, when I came on, it was... That was that was something where I mean I actually felt like I did did quite well when I came on, um, and I I just remember just checking. It, I've got two incidents in, in football where where I felt that I should have done better, and the one was this one that I'm going to talk about the England game where I cut back onto sort of cut inside and then I cut which I did like to do chop on them left and right, and I chopped onto my left and then I've just. Obviously, my weaker foot, and I've just I've hit it quite cleanly, but I've just dragged it just a touch, and it's just sort of glimpsed the post and gone away. And I just thought, oh my word! But I remember, I think Dion might pick me up and just said, "Different class." And it was just, it just, oh, it was, it was amazing. It, I just, I kind of wish that it had gone in, but on the same front, it was just, it was just a, it was, it was brilliant. It was just brilliant to even be in a situation where I'm at Wembley in an England shirt. It's on the box, family are there watching and I've just, you know, I've nearly scored and then the other incident was the Atletico Madrid game where I, I just, to this day, it haunts me so bad that I didn't put it further in the corner where the keepers made the save and, and that goal would have, you know, would have been such a massive, massive turning point in the game because well, it, you know, would have, it would have possibly sent us through. So, the two two incidents in football really stand out of them two. But the, the main, the main one, obviously, is the, uh, the Atletico Madrid. I do it is a regret that I didn't go on and and make more uh, of, of my England career because you know it, it's great that I've got a cap and yeah, it's something you can't take away from me. But I hate being classed as a one cap wonder it's just something that really really annoys me because I do deep down feel like I should have gone on and got more at the time but it just wasn't to be but I've got to be fortunate that I, I've got I've got an England cap under my uh, under my wing so what was your um what was your best memory of of playing for Villa I've got, do you know I've got I've got I've got loads of memories that, that I could go over and over with um you know that have all the lots of good memories lots of bad but I mean the me- the memory that always that always stands out is 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 just when I, the Atletico Madrid game was it's something that always it always stands out. I, 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 it's it's funny because I only watched the game two weeks ago. I, I got it. I, I don't know how I got it, but I ended up getting it. It's a terrible copy that I was watching. It was on, might have been on YouTube. 
and I watched the whole game and it was like, it was something that I just, I've never seen or never been a part of, of atmosphere and, and intensity and what was riding on it. Just a number of things, the pressure and the players that were on the pitch for Atletico Madrid, it was, it was something that was, you know, it really, really always stands out in my mind. Um, and I, I remember having a, being a part of the goals that we scored, Stan scoring that screamer. Um, and again, the chance that I should have should have put away. Um, but it was just, that that will always go to, to my grave with me, that will, because it's something that, you know, always sticks in that heart, you know, that that is what I loved and that's what I, I cherish being Villa Park, packed out atmosphere like you can never imagine being in the, the middle of that, that football pitch and having people just shout you and, and, and go you on was, oh, was incredible. Can you recall the 2000 FA Cup final much? It was a difficult one really um, because I'd been struggling with, a, with an ankle injury and I, I, I remember doing my ankle quite bad um, and I was desperate to get back for the final, uh, for this, for the semis. Um, um, I was desperate to get fit anyway. That's just the way I was. I hated being injured and um, the gaff said, you know, you're not fit enough and stuff like that and I started getting back in the squads and I was strapping my ankle up and then obviously we had the semi-final and, and I just wanted to be a part, I wanted to get on the bench uh, and I said to the gaff, I said, gaff, I'm, I'm fit, honestly, I'm, you know, he said, he said, well, we'll see. So anyway, I ended up being on the bench. And when he, when he put me on, um, I mean, it was, a, it was a crazy game anyway, but when he put me on right at the end, I, I sort of couldn't get my gear off quick enough, but I sort of couldn't understand why. And I was thinking, that's penalties. And obviously I'd, I'd got on and before I knew it, I hadn't even touched the ball and the, the whistle had gone and, you know, we're going into penalties. Um, and that's why he put me on, which, poor. It still gives me the, the, the sort of heebie sort of thinking about it. You know, you think every footballer says, oh yeah, I'll take a penalty, I'll take a penalty. And trust me, there's taking a penalty and there's having that pressure that, that just lies on your shoulders. Because taking a penalty when there is a, a tackle in the box and, you know, you're taking it there and then, but to walk from the halfway line to, the, to a packed out, Wembley, knowing that you've just come on, you haven't touched the football and you've got to take a penalty to keep, you know, Villa in the cup. Wow. I, I can't think of anything more than what Dad always said to me. If you're taking a penalty and you're not sure what to do of where, just pick where you're going to put it and hit it as hard as you can. I just put the ball down and I thought, don't sort of rush it, take your time. And I thought, I'm putting it in that far corner, I'm just going to absolutely smash it. And I just, I hit it so hard. I mean, it was, it was it, I'd say it was a quite, quite a high height and he did get a Daskalan and just got a fingertip to it. But I just knew I'd hit it that well that he wasn't going to save it. And it was just that relief was like scoring the winning goal in front of the whole end, it really was. And and it wasn't even a winning goal, it was just a penalty that I scored to keep the, the penalty who won going. So I can't, the pressure was just immense. It really was. It, I've never felt pressure like that in my whole football career. I, I, I remember the, the final clearly, it was, I think it actually went down as one of the worst finals ever, wasn't it? Um, uh, and it was obviously uh, the last final at, at, at the old Wembley. Yeah, and it was disappointing. It really was because... I actually, I actually felt that we, you know, we could go and win it, you know, at, at the time. And I just always remember the final just being, you know, in comparison to the semi-final, it was just there was no comparison. It was just a very dour performance, and you know, it, it didn't, it didn't meet the expectations it should have done. Um, and obviously, I wasn't involved in the game, you know, which was was disappointing myself. But I, I knew deep down I wasn't going to because. You know, I was, I was battling to try and keep him in the squad anyway with, with this injury, but it was just, yeah, it was a disappointing final, to be honest, and really gutted that, you know, I haven't got that, that FA Cup winner's medal. I've got that, that runners-up one, which is, is upstairs in the drawer somewhere because I don't, I don't feel like having runners-up medals is, is something that, you know, that you, you, you want to keep. I think the boys have took it into school for their show and tell a few times because it's something that I've just, you know, unless I'm winning, 
it, it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't really, it doesn't do anything for me at all. So if you had to, obviously we, we do player ratings in the paper, if you had to rate your Villa career out of 10, yeah. what, what number would you give it and why? I'd probably give myself a seven. Um, yeah, seven, lower seven, but I, I don't know, I just, I, 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 I feel that, you know, I think when I got, when I came into the side and, you know, I didn't, I mean, people do say that, you know, I could have gone on and done a hell of a lot more and stuff like that. I still played a hell of a lot of games for the club and I felt that I should have played a lot more games, if I'm being honest. And, you know, that was down to preference and manager. You know, Graham Taylor wasn't someone that I got on with. Um, we stated earlier about Brian Little, didn't really push me into the squad. I think, you know, there's there's probably 100, 100 games or more that I've missed out on. Um, is why I probably give myself a seven. There's, there's no doubt about it. If you, you know, I, I, I put, a, I put a Villa shirt on when I played football, and when I put that on, I, I was going to work. I was going to work hard. I was going to come off that pitch knowing that I've run around and give everything. Whether I did, you know, whether it turned out that I did play well or I didn't play well, it wasn't the fact that I, I put that on and, and I thought I'm just going to stroll around today. It's never, never been the fact, and it never would have been. Um, so, you know, I'd always, I'd always have that heart to go and play. I felt that I could have done and, and achieved a hell of a lot more. And, you know, my disappointment is that I had to leave the club at 30 where I wanted to finish my whole career at, at the club, which would have been just absolutely perfect for me. Um, but, you know, I had good spells and I had bad spells. And that was the problem, that the consistency that, that wasn't there, that I could have turned around and said, yeah, do you know what, it's a nine or an eight. I just felt that you know a seven would have been would have been probably right for me, and that's just me being my own worst critic. Because, like a lot of people, yeah, I could have done a lot more, but you know it wasn't solely down to me myself. And um, because I, I will blame myself at times, but you know certain managers just didn't fancy had certain formations that we changed on, and you know that that was the, that was the downfall on everything. The goals that that, that I scored at, at Villa, and and you know going back to to scoring in a, a prestigious place, there's no better than scoring it. It might sound corny, but it, it's it's the truth. In front of the whole end was, uh, you know, these are all little pinnacles that I've had in my career, and it makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck. It really does. So talk us through you leaving Villa then, because I think I'm right in saying that your final game for Villa was in Martin O'Neill's first game, is that right? Yeah, because I'd, I'd, I'd spoke to Martin. I was, I was quite pleased that Martin was coming into the club and I thought to myself, he's a, he's a manager that you know I've always admired and uh, you know he's very enthusiastic, he's, he, his back staff were, were very good and, and I thought this is, a, you know, this is a chance, a new manager comes in and I feel that I, I probably suit Martin's sort of style and the way he, he likes to go about his, his football um, and it, it, it just didn't seem to be it didn't um, you know I, did, I was hampered with, with these calf strains I kept getting and I couldn't just couldn't get to grips with them and that was always the problem it was just trying to keep that fitness base so coming to the back end of 30 which uh, was when I left um, and I, I had a conversation with, with, with Martin and he, he was he was golden he was he was straight up with me he just says that you know I'm, I'm I'm looking to change the whole sort of club around. I'm getting a lot of the older players out. I want to bring some new young players in. Um, I think the budget might have gone up with 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 with, with changes around the place. Uh, and he said, you know, if you if you feel that you're not getting enough football, you know, you're granted to go and, and, and get yourself some football. I'm, you know, I won't stand in your way, which was fair enough. He was he was honest with me, which. I, I, I totally respect. Not all managers are like that, and and, and I, I do really respect him for that because, you know, at that stage it was disappointing, it was heart wrenching that I knew I wasn't going to probably be at the club because it was I was coming to the sort of final end of the end of, end of my uh, contracts, and I just felt that I, you know it, it was time that I had to try and get my face back out there because people forget you very easily. So, what was the last day like cleaning out your locker and saying goodbye to so many kind of old friends? Well, do, do you know? Do you know what? When I, I when I actually went out on loan um, to Stoke, it was I, I. I always had in the back of my mind that I was going to prove Martin wrong. 
I was going to prove him wrong that I was good enough to still be at the club and hopefully, hopefully he would have changed his mind. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that I didn't do what I, you know, I had a great, great spell at, at Stoke, um, but it just, it, it didn't, that, that was always my, I always set myself crazy targets and stuff like that, my own personal stuff. And that was one of my targets that I would, I would make him turn his head and, and make him reconsider, really you know, that he'd, he'd have me back at the club. But yeah, to take all my stuff and, and walk out there was, it was, it was hard, but like I said, deep down in my heart, I felt that I'm coming back here. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not leaving here. I'm coming back. Kind of having been a one club man at Villa for I don't know. You tell me, ten or fifteen years. <laughs> you then. You then went on a bit of a travelling road show, didn't you? How many clubs did you yeah. have after Villa? Oh, I've, I've lost count. I lost count. I really have. Listen, that's just my love for the game. It really is. You know, I, I love playing football, and I'll play football as long as I possibly can. But I. <laughs> I did do the rounds a little bit, which I, I feel that I, that I just made to. I made the wrong decisions. You know, I should have gone somewhere. Um, I should have signed for Stoke after leaving Villa was was one of my main regrets. I signed for Sheffield United, um, which just just was the worst thing I could have done because it, you know it just didn't work out. Kevin Blackwell was just an absolute. Well, I, I don't even want to go into it, but. But one of the worst managers I've ever, ever been under um, because he just, for me, that stage of my career, he put the nail in the coffin for me. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't speak to him, I wouldn't, if i seen him to this day, um, because he, he, he made a mockery out of me at Sheffield United and made me look like I was there for, for money and I was, wasn't there for money. I, I came back fit as anything to, to try and prove him wrong um, and to turn the crowd um, which unfortunately I didn't and I've never got to tell the story which I one day I will do um, but you know after that when you're not playing and I'm getting to sort of 32, 33 stages you know you need to keep a maintenance of playing fitness and I, it, it wasn't working at all so you know I had to scout round and, and try and play football it was a tough time in my life anyway you know so I, I was trying to keep on the map um, and I did end up going sort of playing a bit of non-league stuff, which was just didn't suit me at all. You know, it, it was it was it was a big transition from playing Prem Championship and then you know sort of lower leagues. It was very difficult, very um, very demanding. Which I, I just I found was you know there was no football. There was times where I wasn't touching the ball in games, and that's not my that's not my game at all. Um, but yeah, I had a, a massive host of different clubs, uh, you know, towards the back end, which I could draw a line through probably eight of them without a, without a shadow of a doubt. What's the kind of funniest or most ridiculous prank that you've either played or, or witnessed from your time at Villa? <laughs> oh, God. Um, prank. <laughs> the one time I do remember is, the, and this wasn't even at, at Villa as it goes, it was at um, it was at Derby, <laughs> and um, I'd just gone to Derby from Sheffield United, and there was one of the lads, Davo, and we <laughs> we'd been injured, and we'd sort of gone into the change room, and, and it was half time, and Rami coming, you know the 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 uh, he's got a costume on, and he took his he took the Rami head off, and um, he's, he's he's gone gone to the toilet. So yeah, Dave has gone. I, went, I said to Dave, I said, "Go and get some DP." <laughs> uh, we got some DP, and he came back. With, he came back with DP and Vix, and we rubbed it all inside the, the, the Rami's helmet. <laughs> wow, I have never seen anything like it. I couldn't. I, I literally. He carried it under. He was talking. He come out and he, talk, he was talking. He had a cup of tea, and he had he had Rami under his his arm like that. And I, I couldn't look at him because I just knew I was going to burst out laughing. He was being serious about the game. And anyway, we sort of watched him walk out and he's walking up towards the tunnel and then he puts his cup down and he puts his thing on and then he sort of walks out and then he stops and he sort of, he makes a sort of a bit of a movement and I, I've just absolutely killed him. I couldn't stop laughing. It always, always stands out to me in the day. And as the game went on, I remember seen him standing behind the goal but he kept sort of lifting lifting the top of it so he could just sort of get a breather out he must 
I'd love to have seen him after because he'd, he'd have had the reddish boat race I'd have, I'd have ever seen. But we got we got in big trouble for it, and we had to <laughs> to written apology to the to the mascot guy, and um, we had to uh, ram his head dry clean. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, funny, funny. But there's a just off the top of my head, that one was. It was. It was class. There's been lots of uh, been lots of stories that have been quite quite funny. But that always, that one always stands out for me. That. This is the final one from me, mate. And then I'll let you enjoy yeah. the rest of your day. I promise. I've heard a vicious yeah. rumor, and I think you've even confirmed it that your lad supports wolves. What the hell's gone on? <laughs> Oh my goodness me! I, I honestly, honestly do not know. I'm, I'm, I'm mortified. I really am. I don't know where it's come from. I really don't because obviously none of none of us not a, a wolves. You know, I said there's Birmingham fans in the family, but he's he just the one. The one day we we, we were sort of watching a game and stuff, and he he was asking about well, he's really quite young at the time, and. Um, we end up, he's watching a the game, then he, we end up playing computer games and he always kept picking Wolves. So I'm like, I'm playing FIFA and he's like, so why, do you, why are you Wolves? He went, I really like that. I like the colour of the kit. Well, it's gone on and that. So I, I've took the boys down to get Villa kits down at Villa Park. Didn't, didn't want a Villa kit. Once wanted the, he, uh, he called it the orange kit at first. Um, so I thought, do I get him it? And it might just be a phase and we'll, sort of slowly filter it out into the dustbins. Um, nah, that was it. He knew Wolves. Then he started knowing players. And then before I know it, he's, well, Wolves, I, I've seen him in there crying over games because they've got beat. And it's, it was the, I think it was the Watford game at Wembley where they got beat. <laughs> but I remember him bouncing around in there. I think they might have been tuning up and I'm sure Troy scored one late on and they end up losing it. Well, I've never seen a kid, and that's when I knew he, he really did support support the club. To be fair to him, and there's one thing I can take out of this is that you know he isn't a Birmingham fan because he <laughs> wouldn't have been stepping foot in his house if he was. I'll tell you that now for a fact because uh, I couldn't have had that kid in here. There's there's no doubt about it. You know, it, it's one of them things I can't I can't knock out of him. He, hopefully, he'll see sense as he gets that little bit older. Oh no, mate! We'll forgive you anyway because you've been such a br- <laughs> you've been such a brilliant sport. And thanks for thanks for g- generously giving us an hour or more of your time. And yeah, thanks for all thanks for all the brilliant memories that you've um, you've given us in Claret and Blue down the years, mate. Nah, so um, thank you, thank you, all you guys and the fans of you know that you've obviously made it for me. No, I just want to say, stay safe, mate, to you and yours, and yeah, hopefully and we catch up with the point when we're allowed to again. So all right, yeah, definitely will do. Take care. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, up the villa.